Hello ladies and gents, this is Napoleonic Wars, Battle of Waterloo, 1815. This is the last video in Napoleonic Wars. In the last video, uh, Napoleon Endgame, France, 1814, we saw that Napoleon got defeated. Uh, he had to, you know, gave up France and uh, French army and had to, you know, go into exile, I think, in Italy, in the island of Alba. I don't, I'm not sure about the way, yeah, island of Alba. Uh, and I think in this video he's gonna come back and do one last attempt to take over things but clearly since this is the last video it's not going to be successful uh, Napoleon this Napoleonic Wars has been one of the most entertaining history videos I've ever saw because uh, you know Napoleon is just great one of the great brilliant generals his tactics and the way he took over things was damn entertaining yes, at certain points it it looks nearly unrealistic as some Hollywood movie but obviously it happened uh, he was just a brilliant general he did things uh, really great at the start he was really dominant he took over places he took over nearly entire Europe and then he started to get ego and his ego became his downfall because he made a lot of key mistakes one after another to me, one of the biggest mistakes he made was, uh, you know, uh, let Portugal and Spain be there and not squash them. And while the conflict is going there, all the guerrilla warfare and everything is going there, he decided to take half a million of Frenchmen and uh, go invade Russia. And he just thought he's just gonna walk up there, defeat them, and I guess drink cheese all day. But that didn't happen. Uh, Russians gave up Moscow but didn't give up the fight, didn't give up the battle and uh, Napoleon was just stuck there. He wasn't prepared for winter. Winter came, he had to run back. Uh, nearly all his half a million men were dead. Uh, so it was just horrible all around. It was nearly a horror movie. And that was his downfall from there on because his uh, army didn't recover from that. French people didn't recover from that. They were kind of tired like that's a massive blow. After that, he tried to win things. He tried to take things, but clearly but after that, he was kind of weaker than he ever been before. So he tried his best, but that didn't work. Uh, I thought, you know, in the end, we're going to see an epic, uh, you know, collaboration between Napoleon and uh, Marcel Dao. But... Till the end, Dao was preoccupied somewhere and uh, didn't, uh, wasn't with uh, Napoleon by the end. So, you know, in the French, uh, France invasion, you know, I thought it's going to be just uh, pathetic where, you know, the coalition is just going to come and squash Napoleon, but that didn't happen. Napoleon with uh, less than, I think, his army was fourth of the coalition. Coalition had four times more uh, soldiers in that army than Napoleon. He was never outnumbered like that. And still, he kicked back a lot of places. They were starting to run away again. I didn't see that in a long time in Napoleonic Wars and in the last video we saw that. I'm like, damn, he's actually turning things around. But obviously, this is real world and four times the difference, that's just too much. So obviously, it didn't work. He was running back and forth too much. If we had uh, Marcel Dao with him, he could have held on places, but he was uh, running back and forth, north, south, north, south between armies. And that kind of, uh, you know, wasn't going to work. And then he got defeated. He had to give up the his emperor throne and he had to, you know, uh, go to exile in Alba, in Italy. I think he he made a really stupid decision in the end times because uh, he was offered peace terms twice i think he should have taken them because if he had taken them he would have been still the uh, francis emperor and slowly he could have recovered uh, you know hidden with hidden again you know against the uh, entire europe he could have built his army when nobody notices and he could have tried to take things again but his ego got in the way up until the end. He thought he could just run back and forth and win the battle. But clearly that wasn't going to happen. And he kind of knew he was going to lost. Because in the end, he kissed uh, his wife and son. And he knew he wasn't going to see them again or something like that. That is something too, man. His, uh, his, his wife's father, his father-in-law is, I think, Austria's you know, emperor or something. Even he turned his back against him. Because if he was if he was with Napoleon, the things could have turned out very differently. But even he turned his back against him. 
so what does napoleon do when he goes front of his kid and wife like yeah i'm probably gonna see you this last time because i'm gonna get probably gonna get killed because yeah, your father is also trying to kill me i mean how does that even work and clearly he wasn't killed he was exiled but in this video maybe he might be killed i don't know i, I don't know how napoleonic wars end so uh, he probably is gonna get killed here so then what happens his wife and his uh, kid goes to uh, live with uh, you know his uh, her father in austria is that going to happen because they are the one trying to kill napoleon i don't know it's just weird but yeah let's see what uh, napoleon does in this last video one last attempt April 1814. For ten years, one man has dominated Europe. Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French. Under his military genius, France conquered an empire that spanned the continent. But finally, he has been defeated by a grand coalition of his enemies. Napoleon is forced to abdicate and exiled to the tiny island of Elba while the Bourbon monarchy is restored to France in the corpulent form of Louis XVIII. Monarchy is restored. French people are not going to like that. They did whole revolution and everything. And monarchy is back. But rumors soon reach Napoleon that France would welcome his return. The French people have little love for the monarchy or its hangers-on, the very people whose excesses led to the French Revolution 25 and I think <laughs> the people who became monarchy, they, they're taking a massive risk because in French Revolution, lots of people just die left and right. Lots of people face guillotine. That's just... <laughs> and after that, choosing to become monarchy of France is just kind of, you know, I would not do it in any position. Five years before, he also learns that at the Congress of Vienna, his enemies are locked in bitter dispute over the future of Europe. Napoleon decides to act. After just 10 months in exile, he returns to France, where the troops sent to arrest him rally to his cause instead. Most of France soon follows suit. <laughs> Everybody just went there, all right, all right, you're under arrest. And he's like, dude, I'm Napoleon. And everybody will be like, Ah, you're all right, and everybody just followed him. <laughs> but in Vienna, the coalition immediately put their differences to one side. <laughs> one thing, one thing is awesome, and that French people in the end was you know kind of tired. Like we can't even do guerrilla warfare right now because we are so tired. I don't care, kill Napoleon, but end this. That's what their mentality was. And in just 10 months, he's like, you know what? We are just ready. Let's go up for round two. This is astonishing, man. And obviously, coalition of this, uh, you know, countries, they were having dispute and they're like, Napoleon did what? He's back. He's taken France again. And everybody just pulls, put aside their uh, issues and just ran back. And also that, how, how stupid is that, man? They didn't put any safety measures there, like Napoleon or anybody can just walk back and take France. They didn't put some kind of army or something there that would stop that. Napoleon literally just walked back and took over France. They declare Napoleon an outlaw and mobilize their forces for war. Napoleon knows he must act boldly before the coalition launches a coordinated invasion of France. He counts on winning a quick victory and then negotiating peace from a position of strength. He targets the coalition armies within easiest reach. Prince Blücher's Prussian army and the Duke of Wellington's Anglo-Allied army, both camped in Belgium. Napoleon's force is a match for either coalition army on its own, but he'll be heavily outnumbered if they're able to join forces. So he must keep them apart and defeat each in turn. Damn, look at the effect. Napoleon. 
Napoleon's army crosses the frontier near Charleroi, intending to drive a wedge between the two coalition armies. The next day, Napoleon sends his left wing under Marshal Ney to take the crossroads at Quatre Bras. There, Ney clashes with Wellington's army, still scrambling into position. The Allied troops fight off a series of French attacks and just manage to hold their ground. The same day, Napoleon attacks Blücher's Prussian army with his main force near the village of Ligny. The battle is a brutal slugging match, but the French emerge triumphant. Damn. The 72-year-old Blücher leads a cavalry charge in person and has his horse killed under him. He only just escapes capture. Damn, Napoleon start to win again. The Prussian army retreats, but it is not broken. Napoleon sends his right wing under Marshal Grouchy to keep them on the run Marshal and turns Grouchy. his own attention to Wellington's army. The British general doesn't receive news of Blücher's defeat until the next morning, at which point he orders a retreat through heavy summer showers to a position eight miles south of Brussels, near the village of Waterloo. There, you go. there he receives a promise from Blücher that the Prussians will march to his aid the next morning. So Wellington decides to stand and fight. Wellington has chosen his battlefield with care. His troops are behind a gentle ridge which will give them some shelter from French cannon fire. His right flank is anchored on the farmhouse of Hougoumont, his center on the farm of La Haye Sainte, and his left on the farm of Papillot. All three are fortified and garrisoned with elite troops. Wellington's men need every advantage they can get. The opposing armies are roughly equal in size, but his is a ragtag mix of British, Dutch, and German troops many of whom have never seen combat before. They will have to hold off Napoleon's army. And it's, not just, it's not just that, if it's from different countries, it's hard to command them. And while those 72,000 are all French under Napoleon, so Napoleon clearly has the advantage here. We are veterans until Prussian reinforcements arrive, or the battle and probably the war will be lost. Sunday dawns bright and fair. Napoleon has ordered Marshal Grouchy to pursue the Prussians and keep them busy, while he defeats Wellington's army at Waterloo and opens the road to Brussels. But it's Grouchy who gets pinned down, fighting the Prussian rearguard at Wavre. The main Prussian force eludes him and is already marching to Wellington's aid. At Waterloo, Napoleon delays his attack, waiting for the ground to dry, which will make movement easier for his troops. But the lost hours will later prove costly. The battle begins around 11 a.m., when Napoleon orders a feint against Wellington's right flank at Hougoumont. He hopes Wellington will commit his reserves here, drawing them away from the center where the main blow will fall. But Hougoumont's British and German defenders cling on desperately throughout the day. At one point, the French force their way through the main gate, but it's shut behind them, and the intruders are all killed. Damn! That is calculated, men. They got inside the doors, and you know, they knew they're gonna get inside the doors, obviously, and then they just closed the doors behind them and killed all of them. That's conniving, man. Damn. Wellington later calls it the decisive moment of the battle. Around noon, 80 French cannon open fire against the main Allied line. Most of Wellington's men are out of sight on the reverse slope, but many cannonballs still find their mark, smashing bloody holes in the Allied ranks. At 1.30 p.m., Napoleon sends in his infantry. How horrible is that, man? I get it, you're near, if you're in some kind of war, 
and you die in your battle while trying to shoot somebody you see enemies they're shooting at you sometimes it's just one on one fight sometimes you just get hit with some kind of a weapon or something that's understandable it's war you died but the, you, know, you you your position hasn't even started here the war population has started here and some cannon comes and kills you i mean like if you die in actual battle or try to kill somebody it makes sense but you're just standing there some cannon comes and kills you that's just sad man the french columns are met by disciplined musket fire and then charged by british heavy cavalry the french attack disintegrates as napoleon's men try to save themselves from the crushing hooves and flashing sabers scores of frenchmen are ridden down and two of their famous eagle standards are captured but the british cavalry exhilarated by success charge too far they become scattered their horses blown at their most vulnerable they're countercharged by french cavalry and suffer terrible losses among the dead major general sir william ponsonby commander of the union brigade around 4 p.m. marshal ney thinks he sees the allies begin to retreat he and thinks a mass cavalry charge to drive home the advantage but ney is wrong the allied infantry are ready formed in hollow squares with sam they are on formation and uh, the french are on horses this is going to end bad for the french and it's fixed The French cavalry can't break into these impregnable formations. They can only circle impotently until they retreat or are shot from the saddle. Ney's failure to support this attack with either infantry or artillery is a serious blunder. Meanwhile, Blucher's Prussians have begun to arrive. Damn. They capture the village of Plancenoit. let me get this straight first napoleon's battle he goes there against the british you know try to take over farm they are just basically theatrically killed they were trapped inside door close and just got got killed then you know ney thinks they are retreating goes there but faces the formation they are not retreating and basically causes a massive blunder and now prussian army is approaching this does not look good for napoleon man He's not getting any victories here. Noir, threatening Napoleon's flank and forcing him to send reserves to recapture it. Around 6 p.m., French infantry finally capture the farmhouse of La Haye Sainte in the center of the battlefield. It allows the French to bring forward artillery and blast the allied squares from close range. Add something. They can't miss the closely packed formations. and casualties quickly mount it begins to seem that if wellington's army doesn't retreat it will be killed where it stands i don't get it they're cannon store why not they're using back but the situation for napoleon is also desperate the prussians are arriving in force and he's running out of men to throw against wellington's army So he turns to his ultimate reserve, the elite Imperial Guard, the most feared troops in Europe. Damn, look at that. How tall are they? Damn. <laughs> Imperial Guard, the most feared troops in Europe. At 7:30 p.m., 3000 of these battle-hardened veterans march past their emperor and across the corpse-strewn battlefield Just towards the allied down, center. Down. Wellington's redcoats rise to meet them and pour devastating volleys of musket fire into their ranks. When the allies fix bayonets and prepare to charge, the imperial guard wavers and then retreats. to him that's something sensing victory orders a general advance about the same time the prussians recapture plancenoit 
news of the Imperial Guard's defeat and rumours of encirclement by the Prussians sweep through the French ranks. Panic breaks out, and the French army flees the battlefield. Only Napoleon's old guard maintain their discipline, mounting a heroic but doomed rearguard action. Napoleon himself is forced to abandon his carriage and barely escapes the pursuing Prussian cavalry. Did that just happen? Oh my god, he shouldn't have come back. He should have just leave in Alba. But this was just horrendous, man. He was not getting any victories there. British just were kicking their asses. And then the most elite soldiers of entire Europe went there with all the, you know, uh, all the macho-ness and just got their ass kicked and they retreated. That news just spread and all French soldiers like, oh, that's it. We are running back. This is not going to work. Damn. This doesn't even look like a Napoleon war. This was so sad, man. The battle is won. The Duke of Wellington and Prince Blücher meet and congratulate each other outside Napoleon's former headquarters, an inn called La Belle Alliance. Blücher thinks it's the perfect name for their shared victory, but Wellington prefers the more English-sounding Waterloo, where he has his own headquarters. The Battle of Waterloo was, in the words of the Duke of Wellington, a damned near-run thing. It was also one of the bloodiest battles of the age. Around 50,000 men were killed or wounded, 23,000 coalition casualties, 27,000 French. Due to an appalling shortage of medical care, many of the wounded were left lying on the battlefield for several days. God, that's just screwed up. Napoleon was utterly defeated. Unable to raise another army, he surrendered to the British. They transported him to a second exile on the tiny, remote Atlantic island of St. Helena. This time, there was no escape. <laughs> First time, like, okay, go to Italy. Go to Italy, you're in exile. He, he just basically walks back and this time, you know what? Let's just put him all the different place and the South, South, South Africa side. Throw him in the distance so he can't just walk back. <laughs> he died there six years later. Waterloo marked the beginning of a period of relative peace in Europe. There were no wars between the great powers for 40 years and the British would not fight on the continent for another hundred years, until the summer of 1914. Forty years after the battle, a pioneer in the new art of photography captured these remarkable images. They're veterans of Napoleon's armies, by then all old men in their 70s and 80s. Among them, Sergeant Tanya of the Imperial Guard, Moray of the 2nd Regiment of Hussars, and Verlin of the 2nd Guard Lancers. These faces are a tantalizing link to the dramatic events that shaped the course of history two centuries ago. Ah. Oh. This was a sad video though. I saw the video and it's like 14 minutes long. I'm like, yeah, this is, this is not going to end well. <sighs> Napoleon basically got his ass kicked and by who? British. The whole Napoleonic Wars, it was said that British cannot match, match Napoleon on the ground. That's why they always fought on naval, naval areas. This time, they kicked his ass in the end. That's just something, man. That was so calculated, so especially trapping the soldiers inside the, uh, th that farm, closing the door and killing them all. That's just, that's where it all started.
Imperial Guards just, you know, marched there thinking we are gonna crush them and just had to retreat. And that's it, morale was just shattered right there. Every French army soldiers just ran away. That's just sad, man. Napoleon had to run back. And what's astonishing is they exiled him again. They didn't kill him. I get it could cause some kind of a martyr situation where French people could rise again because of that. So maybe that's why they kept him alive or something. But damn, this is just something. But of all these things, every single Napoleonic war, one thing is astonishing is Napoleon was still alive. He didn't die on battle even though he was accompanying his soldier in the battle every single time. This was something, Napoleonic Wars, that was just great. I, I never knew history could be so entertaining. This was so great. The last video was a bit too sad. If he had won some victories here and there, it would have been fine. Like, you know, last uh, attempt. But he was just, he was just utterly annihilated in the end. All right, if you like my reaction, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Now I think I'm gonna do some uh, Epic History's World War II videos and somewhere in between I will also do Napoleon's Marshall's videos. Alright, if you like my video please don't forget to like and subscribe.